Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including High Tech Okie, Logan Larson, and Mike Akins. Coming up on DTNS, video meetings aren't as good for brainstorming. Have we finally achieved over-the-air power for the average consumer? And Snap has a personal selfie drone. They, they called it Pixie. Hey, Pixie. Take a selfie of it. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 28th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. It's actually Thursday, Tom. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Listen, I write what Roger tells me to say. I, I <laughs> tell you what Roger writes me to say. I just want to make sure you say. know what day it is. Yeah. From a city famous for confusing what time or day it is in Las Vegas, Nevada, I'm Justin Robert Young. <laughs> from a not confusing city, drawing the top tech stories, I'm Len Peralta. From the wild wilderness of Alaska, I'm Anthony Lemos. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, so blame me, because I'm the show's <laughs> producer. <laughs> All right, let's start with a few tech things you should know. The Financial Times saw an email from Twitter to ad agencies reassuring them that their advertisements would not appear beside offensive content. The letter seems to be in response to fears of what might happen after Elon Musk's pending purchase of Twitter. The company also identifies that it had miscounted daily users for the past three years by up to 1.9 million. The error was to count all accounts of a single user as active if one of those users' accounts was actually active. Twitter still reported a 10 million rise in users over the last quarter to a now more accurate 229 million users. Twitter lost $128 million on revenue of $1.2 billion in the quarter. Meta bounced back from a decline, you may remember, in daily active users last quarter. This time, they gained... About 300 million uh, for a total of 1.96 billion uh, daily active users. Revenue from the family of apps, that's what Meta calls Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, fell 13%. And Reality Labs, the uh, the metaverse part of Meta, lost $2.96 billion. That's compared to $1.83 billion it lost a year ago, although that's in line with an increase in spending on development. So they, they expect it to lose money, and it did. Samsung reported its operating profit rose 15, 51% on the year. Chips made up more than half of that profit as demand for DRAM and NAND remained strong due to data center buildouts. Samsung's foundry business also had its high, highest ever Q1. It's good news, at least for that portion of the company. The second largest contributor to the profits was MX and networks. That includes phones. The Galaxy S22 led the way, but sales were strong in the mid-tier as well. The consumer business unit was the only kind of bad news here. That division sells home appliances, TVs as well. A combination of unusually high demand during the pandemic now easing off and the effects of Russia's war in Ukraine caused a slight drop in operating profits there. All right, let's get away from earnings for a second. The Central African Republic has become the second country after El Salvador to adopt Bitcoin as legal currency. Uh, if you don't know, which you might not, the country uses a French-backed currency, the Franc CFA, as its paper currency. The Franc CFA is issued by the Financial Cooperation in Central Africa, but it's tied to a franc that is based on the French version of the euro. Uh, it's part of the Economic and Monetary Community of Central Africa, kind of a an EU-like organization, or an e maybe more like an European economic community sort of organization in Central Africa. The franc CFA is also used by Cameroon, Chad, Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. The move to adopt Bitcoin in the Central African Republic is seen as a way to gain financial independence from the influence of France because it backs the franc CFA over CAR's currency. Google is making some changes to search. The company previously let users request the removal of links from the search index if they pointed to information that could lead to identity or financial theft. Google has now added images of identification documents, such as a driver's license, confidential login credentials, personal contact inform information like where you live physically, what your phone number is, what your email address is. 
Google told The Verge that the policy applies to sites that don't immediately show the information, but offer it in exchange for payment. Google also expanded the categories of ads that you can ask to be hidden. Those settings now apply to all Google's display ad network, not just YouTube. And in addition to gambling and alcohol, you can also request Google to block ads in the categories of dating, pregnancy, parenting, and weight loss. All right, let's talk a little more about wireless power, but not what, what kind of wireless power are we talking here, Justin? Uh, Tom, I'm so glad you brought up wireless power because what I'm not talking about are the finicky ones where you have to lay your phone on a pad just right. I mean, real, true, over the air, I can walk around and my thing gets charged wherever it is in the room, wireless power. We all want that, of course. Well, Throughout the time of this show, we've covered lots of contenders to bring us over-the-air charging, PowerCast, uh, uh, and Erogis, and yet we don't have widespread over-the-air power, at least not for consumers. But the examples are building up, so maybe we're getting close to an actual in-the-home over-the-air power solution. For example, a French company called Arcos announced several products to come this year that use Osea's Coda wireless power system. That system just got US FCC approval in March. Coda uses radio wave oscillation to generate power. But those Arcos products haven't launched yet. Maybe Belkin, a big name when it comes to charging, can beat them to the punch. Belkin announced their partnership with WeCharge. The WeCharge system uses infrared beams to send up to one watt of power within a 40-foot range. The device needs to be in sight of the ceiling-based transmitter. And don't worry, you're not going to get cooked. The transmitter will only shine when a device needs charging and direct the beam at the device. The system could be good for devices that spend a lot of time in standby mode, like doorbells, locks, sensors, and the like. WeCharge says it and Belkin both plan to release a product with the tech sometime this year. Belkin isn't saying what its product is, but WeCharge calls a specific center stage product. And Belkin would only confirm that it signed an R&D deal with WeCharge, telling TechCrunch, quote, we only launch products when we confirm technical feasibility, backed by deep consumer insights. Uh, I, wa I, wa I want this. I, I do. <laughs> um, and we have Nick with a C joking in the chat room. He's like, ah, I don't want the cancer it'll give me. Uh, and I know Nick knows this, but uh, it does not give you cancer. It's no different in one sense to Wi-Fi, the the, the one that, that comes from Ossia, or light in the other sense, which yeah. is what the infrared one is. Uh, so sure, any any of those could give you cancer if, if, if improperly used, but they, they should be properly used. My question is, why these haven't yet been in, put anywhere outside of an enterprise situation or factory situation, which seems to be cost. In, in a factory yeah. situation, if you have thousands of devices to charge, sure, Walmart on one of its big warehouse floors is using Ossia because... It's they can they can pay that money and it's worth it for them. But in the home, we we don't want to pay huge amounts of money because we only have a few devices to charge, relatively speaking. And and in general, the batteries are big enough that you only have to charge them a little bit and you can do it overnight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned, Justin, was like I don't know, like a like a like a, a door lock. And turns out, just this morning, I had to deal with a dead. Uh, keypad door lock that uh, a bunch of Airbnb people were extremely upset uh, was not working. And this would have saved me quite a bit because <laughs> in situations like this, it's like you never think about the batteries until there's something wrong and then you think about them. So to never have to think about them because you're being proactive would be a great use case here. Yeah. I, I guess the hope that I would take from this story is we're seeing an increasing drumbeat of these. You know, five, six mm -hmm. years ago, it was like, somebody has demonstrated that this could work right now we're yeah. seeing like companies have deployed it they're just not able to deploy it either efficiently or cost effectively enough but belkin getting on board even though they rushed as you said justin to kind of say like hey we're not announcing a product uh hold your horses there why charge uh i i think the fact that they're on board at all is a good sign uh that, that yeah. at least we're getting closer well, they're going to have to be in that in that in that market. Uh, the big question here is what is the price to, for the consumer, mm -hmm. and also how much power it really delivers. Because if yeah, it's very yeah. very One slow, like a lot of these Q charging uh, stations are, then you know. 
Well, in the past, we've talked a lot about using VR for lots of reasons, for fun, but also as a pain management tool. And lots of studies are still being done on that part of it. But we wanted to call attention briefly to a study being done by a company called Applied VR. Usually, when you do a study like this, you have a control group. That's the group that isn't receiving the studied treatment. In this case, it would be VR. And then a group using the studied treatment, and then you compare them and see if there is a measurable difference. This is, you know, kind of just science. science. Stuff. Yes. If you, didn't, if you didn't have to have the control group, could cut your expenses of recruitment and trial management, as well as make sure that everybody who signs up gets that treatment. Right now, if you sign up for a clinical trial you might get the placebo and that might be okay with you, but it also might be disappointing depending on who you are. So Applied VR is working with Komodo Health to do something called a synthetic control arm. Komodo has a large database of anonymized health records. It can provide Applied VR with the data of people uh, with chronic pain without having to enroll them in the trial. And then they can be used as a control group to compare with the experience of the people that are actually in the trial. Now, we couldn't find out, at least, you know, we reached out to Komodo and we didn't hear back by recording time. So we couldn't find out what protections against de-anonymization Komodo is using, if any. But the FDA is still evaluating the use of synthetic uh, control arms. It's previously approved one for a cancer study and has also approved applied VR's use of one. This is fascinating because it is a great example. Uh, let, let's let's assume for argument's sake that Komodo Health does get back to us and, and says like, oh yeah, we're using differential privacy like Apple does or some you know something very valid like that. We're like, okay, yeah. great. We all feel good about this. This is an example of why it's good to share your data because if it's responsibly used, it can be used for something like this, where a clinical trial can be done and more cost effectively, which is good for the treatment, uh, bring the cost down of healthcare, uh, and more efficiently, which means they can do it faster. Um, and and yes, the FDA is going very carefully to make sure that it's also as good as if you had an actual control group. Uh, but so far, the early signs are that it is, and I think it's a it's a great example of where data sharing we we always hear the bad stories, we never hear the good. Yeah, and, and I think this is this is a confluence of a few different things, including the fact that VR being used as a therapeutic really shows how far that platform has continued to come. Uh, uh, you know, when it when it uh, relates to any kind of disability stuff, the fact that VR has gotten as potent and as cheap and available as it has means that this is a real research tool. But I think, like you said, Tom, the big story here is just the benefit of anonymized uh, uh, records and assuming that we are all assuming that everything is able to, to be kept safe, uh, uh, this is kind of a game changer. Yeah. I, 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 I have reservations about the privacy implications only because they didn't make it clear on their website. I went, I, I right. scoured all over. Maybe you kind of have it. to assume the worst until you, but I'm like, what's going why on. Why aren't you out front saying like, here is the privacy yeah. protection. Here's the de-anonymization we use because they say they anonymize it. And that's great. I believe them. But the problem yeah. is just anonymizing data isn't always enough to stop reverse engineering to be able to, to de-anonymize it, right? And so you need to take extra protections for that. And when you're talking about health data, you're talking about HIPAA compliance in the United States and yep. other rules elsewhere. Uh, that's important. You need to make sure that that data is well protected because you want people to feel comfortable sharing it so you can do things like this. Yeah. A, a yeah. Have, 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 yeah, I have that second layer of utility. Yeah, yeah. All right, folks, uh, if you have a thought about this uh, on the show, maybe you work at Komodo Health and would like to email us the answer. Yeah. Uh, here's our email address. <laughs> feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. <laughs> Uh, psychology scientists at Columbia University published a study in Nature looking at the impact of video meetings on creativity versus having a meeting in person. The study observed 745 pairs of engineers across Portugal, Israel, Finland, Hungary, and India. They asked them to come up with creative ideas. They gave them a Frisbee or some bubble wrap and said, come up with some ideas of what we could do with these, make new products. Meetings held with the participants in the same room generated about 17% more ideas than the meetings held on WebEx, which is about an extra idea per meeting on average. 
One of the study's authors, uh, Dr. Melanie Brooks, tested for connectedness, social connectedness, and it's all detailed in the paper how you test for that, found that people in the video calls were just as connected with each other as the people who met in person. So it wasn't like the, there was too much distance for them to get each other. Uh, she also tracked eye movements and found that people in the same room looked away from each other more often than people on video who tried to maintain eye contact. On video, you want people to think you're paying attention, so you try to look at them. In person, it's kind of impolite to stare. Uh, we, it's fairly well established that we, vo we, vote, we devote a lot of attention to faces. Our brains just do that. But we don't like to stare at someone when we're in the same room at them all the time. So it's possible that people on video are using more of their brain power to process faces because they're forcing themselves to look at them, leaving less room for creative thinking. Remote meetings do work well for the less creative parts of the process. Uh, while the remote teams generated fewer and less creative ideas, they picked the best options out of the ones they developed. And the way they tested for this is the ideas were all evaluated by a team of outside experts, people that were not part of the team. And the remote engineers tended to pick the better option from the ones they came up with slightly more often than the in-person teams. So the remote meetings were focused. They were just a little too focused to be creative. Uh, so anyway, uh, as a result of this meeting, Dr. Brooks now turns off her camera on Zoom when she's brainstorming to just kind of make sure that she's not focusing too much on the other person's face. I mean, it is, we're all doing the show remotely and, and we have for many years and we're all pretty used to it, but there are other projects that I do where some of my in-person work had had to be remote because of the pandemic and, and, and is to this day and we've all adjusted, but I have definitely noticed some nuanced stuff as far as communication goes that really, that really speaks to everything that you've just laid out, Tom. What, what I think is interesting about this is, well, first of all, the eye contact thing is so true. I mean, yeah, you can't just stare at somebody in a meeting. Like they'd be like, what are you doing after a while? Like, why do you keep looking at me? What do you want yeah. me to say? Uh, but, but when you're, you know, staring, you know, face forward on, uh, on a video call, you're not really looking into someone's soul in the same way. Maybe you are, but they, they may not feel that way. What I thought, what I thought was the biggest takeaway, though, from this is, yeah, fewer creative ideas, but actually the best ideas were generated over over the video chat experiment. And maybe that maybe there's just a little bit that happens in a humans physically together in a conference room or 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 the like that once taken away gets people a little bit more focused. Well, and it made me think, okay, turn off the camera for the brainstorming and then turn the camera back on when it's time to figure out which of the ideas you're actually gonna do, right? Yeah. Well, I think that there's also a lot that sort of goes into the mainstream uh, uh, space that these kind of video conferences have in our lives right now, up to and including the idea that when we are looking dead into that camera, we may or may not be looking in, in the faces of the people that we are talking to. We might be looking at ourselves. Right. Like mm -hmm. there, there's yeah, a lot too. that happens when it comes to this this one unbroken eye contact thing. You are right that it signals I'm paying attention and I'm alert. Somebody that's constantly looking off camera is giving signals that they they might not otherwise uh, uh, have have uh, on their mind. Like, for example, normally in my office, I have a big monitor and then I have the camera that is on my MacBook for which I am running everything. Uh, I've learned that I can't look at the people on my gigantic monitor, which is a lot cooler, because that's rude. I'm I'm looking off to the side and not connecting with them. That being said, there is obviously something different with the the kind of a, a, a scrambling desire when somebody is in person to get something done. There is an immediacy that happens that whether it be cultural or physiological, I, I, I don't think can be denied in terms of the volume of like, let's just get something done. Let's stick something to the wall and, and go from there. As for the fidelity of those ideas, I don't think that that's something that we could reasonably determine in, in one study, no matter how comprehensive this was. Yeah, and it was a slight 
uh, amount of favor for the the video meeting. So it's the kind of thing that you could do the study again and it might go the other way. Yeah. It was pretty close to even though. It was she wasn't trying to say in the study, and neither one of them were trying to say in the study that that video meetings were better for selection. It was just like, you yeah, know, we didn't see a difference. In fact, we saw it slightly tilting this way, at least this time when we looked. I'd like to know what uh the creative ideas for using a frisbee and or bubble wrap would be. You should read you should read the uh the article there's the the actual journal article has some of them uh i, listed I actually there. i already did but i figured some other people were like hmm, that sounds kind of cool <laughs> what yeah, they yeah. come up with yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll be in our show notes but uh yeah i i don't i don't know i i think probably because it has been something i i i had no control over for 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 the better part of two and a half years now. Um I I'm pretty pro video call as long as we're all we're all there. Everybody's alert, taking notes, doing the things, making our talking points. But I can see where this is going to continue to be an issue, uh, especially since some people are going back into in-person work. Some people are trying to figure out when that is necessary and when it isn't and and how that how that relates to productivity. Yeah, I think it's important to remember uh, that the study didn't say brainstorming was awful over video meeting. No. It said it was 17% less creative. So if you're like, we need to optimize, maybe we should try to get in person or turn our cameras off, possibly. Uh, this is not a definitive, like, video meetings are bad or anything like that. You're right. No, no, no. I, I do think that the part of the evolution here is our culture for this. You know, uh, um, yeah. the video conferences were something that, although obviously this audience is probably very familiar with it, to the mainstream of society is about two years old. And people are still getting used to the idea of what does it mean? When am I a good participant? When am I a bad participant? And, and I think what we're seeing here is a, a, a evolution of all this. Yeah, it's, it's how we learn to be better at it, right? Is to understand like, oh, okay, it's a, you have to account for that. So let's, let's adapt. And I think that's good. Well, Snap announced quite a few things today. Let's run through them, shall we? Augmented reality experiences at Live Nation concerts, assistive devices like wheelchairs and hearing aids for Bitmoji avatars, and new editing tools called Director Mode. However, there is one piece of news that's capturing a lot of attention, and that is Snap's selfie drone called Pixie, retailing for $230. Pixie is a drone-powered camera, so camera and a drone that can fly around, record video and photos for then sharing on Snapchat, although also to third party applications. Pixie doesn't have a controller, just four preset flight paths that you select with a dial. So hover, reveal, orbit or follow. Then when it's done flying, because it's a little thing, it automatically comes back and lands on your hand Aww. or, yeah, or, you know, whatever you're, you're, you're giving it to land on. Photos and videos are wirelessly transferred and saved into Snapchat memories. You can then use editing tools and lenses and sounds. That's all within Snapchat to customize the captured video, make it cool, share from there. And like I said, you can share on other platforms as well because it's just it's saved into your phone. The battery is good for about five to eight flights. Spare batteries cost about $20. Pixie users will need to be aware of local laws and regulations in the U.S. and also France about drone usage. They may vary. And you can learn more if you're interested at Pixie.com. Yeah, interesting that France is a launch country alongside the United States. Uh, so good for you, France. You, you, you got something first, too. Uh, welcome. We. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I think sweet. it's if you're if you're being cool, Justin, it's weh. 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 Uh, weh. weh. I think weh. this is weird. Uh, if this was ninety nine dollars, <laughs> I'd call it genius. Like, oh, it's a little toy selfie thing. Fun, you know. Drop a less than a hundred bucks on it, you know, and and make your selfies for Snapchat. I'm sure a lot of people are going to do this. At two hundred thirty dollars, though, it starts to feel like. Okay, well, follow isn't new. Like other more expensive drones can do this, and I don't know how much more expensive they really are. I guess two hundred thirty is pretty good. Amos, I know you do a lot of drone uh, footage. You do a lot of drone shooting. Where, yeah. where do you put this? So uh, when I initially looked at it, and we were talking about it in the pre-show, I was concerned because two hundred thirty dollars that that puts it in a certain bracket. That puts it in the two hundred to three hundred dollar bracket for drones. And a lot of the things that I saw here didn't seem up to snuff. Once I started really looking into it, 
the camera size, the the resolution, things like that are actually pretty consistent in that price range. Um, the problems that I see with this, because I think this is a genius product, just like you said, at ninety nine dollars, this sells off, flies off the shelves, and, and is perfect for you know your average teen or or young adult that just wants to take these cool little selfies. Um, the problems I see with it are that you're not getting a lot of the features that you can get in other drones, which fair enough. If you're a beginner drone flyer or something like that, you that that's fine because you don't need all those extra features. Um, the other thing that I that I found concerning was that there's no built-in safety measures for geolocation and restricted air airspace things like that. Now that might not be so important because it's only flying, mm -hmm. you know. 10, 15 feet in the air, but that can still be something that can get the users in trouble. And without any built-in safeguards that a lot of the more expensive drones have, that can really get you a pretty hefty fine. Um, but for this price point, I think just like you said, it's a little too expensive to be that sweet spot where $99 would be amazing. Even $150 would be a really good price for something like this for its intended purpose. At $230, you're kind of getting into a little bit more advanced range. You can get yeah, a DJI look, Mini look, for about that. that. Look, they, 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 they'll sell it for $99 when they can make it for $40, which they, right. they I don't think that they can. And they, what they want to do, I, I don't like comparing these to other drones because it's not for drone people. It is a... Right. A, a, a peripheral for social media that uses drone technology. My issue is I totally agree that $230 is only for the richest of rich kids that are going to Lollapalooza. Uh, uh, there are cheaper <laughs> ways that you can do more exciting social media content. I think this is yep. a good idea. It's a good first step. But Snapchat as a hardware business has always seemed to come in just a little too expensive and a little underwhelming. Well, it's probably because they made the camera good, right? You make that camera yes. cheap, you can get it down yes. to ninety nine bucks. But then everybody complains about the, how the photos or videos are no good. So, yeah, maybe, you know, that's a rock and a hard place, I guess. So just yeah. ask, just tell your mom that you're rolling out the black card and you're going to buy a pixie, and uh, yeah, you're really excited to see Playboy Cardi this summer. Coachella or just Lollapalooza? Well, Coachella already happened, so uh, I'm well, trying. But to, for next year, to, yeah, I guess you're going to wait a year. year. There'll be a new yeah. pixie. The pixie be too. New Tom, pixie. the yeah, cool exactly. kids are talking about Lollapalooza. Right yeah, we're already. That's exactly. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. That's, that's yeah. what we're doing. But, but I mean, with replaceable batteries, you could. I mean, you know, you could get a lot of flights of each. I just feel like gonna... uh, because people can. I don't know when you get too many people into uh, a uh, music festival. It's like, what if my pixie is about to land on my hand and someone snatches it? Takes and someone pixie. moshes, moshes right into you. Moshes yeah. with Next my pixie, you know. even worse. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's another thing. There, there's a downward camera they mosh, for they mosh placement. They mosh shows now. This is a problem. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a downward camera for placement for landing and taking off, but there's no peripheral sensors or uh, sensors above or anything else. So it, it, I could see it causing some problems, but I just think it's it's a hair too expensive for, for the market that's going for. But like Justin said, that's what Snap does. So. It's cute. It's called Pixie. It is. I, I I love the build. I will say that it it looks yeah. great, and 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 if it if it behaves like it does in the video, I think it's an extraordinarily cool product. All right. Well, we'll see if uh, Snapchat can uh, in iterate on this one faster than Spectacles and and turn it into <laughs> something compelling. Yeah. Uh, if you go to Lollapalooza, let us know. We want pixie videos. Please do. Please send your pixie videos. <laughs> All right. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. High Tech Bill wrote in and said on yesterday's GDI portion, you were talking about battery recycling. Bill is right. Uh, Patrick Martin and Roger and I were talking about this. Bill says, not a plug, but Batteries Plus, recycling services for customers at Batteries Plus, will take them for free. My wife and I use them. I did a quick check for locations in California. They do have them. No clue if they're anywhere close to any of you, but uh, wanted to pass it along. Well, thank you, High Tech Bill. Uh, yeah. I, I just saw Bill in Austin uh, with Justin Robert Young a few weeks mm -hmm. ago. Uh, yep. So it's nice to hear from him. Also, he's referring to something that's in the extended version of the show called Good Day Internet uh, to our patrons. Uh, and I have to say, yesterday, I listened to DTNS on the plane ride back from Las Vegas, 
and was like, I oh, will listen to DTNS. And then, you know, I might not listen to all of GDI. I might want to move on and, and do other things. I listened to the whole darn thing because that battery conversation with Patrick was, was compelling. Y'all had some interesting things to say about St. Louis, which is near and dear to my heart. So yeah. I don't know, folks, look at what you're missing out. If you don't go to patreon.com slash DTNS, I'm just saying. It's, it's a wonderful program. And they do well in tandem. Two tastes that go great together. I couldn't resist. And I wasn't even on it. So there you go. Uh, Hey, you know what else I can't resist? The art of Len Peralta. What have you drawn Mm. for us today, Len? You know, uh, I do a lot of brainstorming, both in person and Could online. You turn off your camera, then, if you're going to brainstorm. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, let me let me go ahead and do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is uh, I found this fascinating. Uh, just you know, like you said, there, as far as brain use and everything else uh, uh, on an online call. But this is my version of what this would look like using the frisbee and the uh, uh, the bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> this guy here, Jerry, is saying, uh, Frisbee's bubble wrap can't come up. Ideas, you also beautiful eyes transfixed. And of course, everybody on the call is like, Jerry, you're on mute. Jerry, you're mute. muted. Muted, Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. Jerry, you're muted. Ah, too real. Too real. <laughs> this man. is the reality, right? Um, <sighs> this image is available right now over my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. You can, if you're a backer, you can get it right now. Or if you're old school and like to spend money, Go to lenperaltastore.com where uh, you can also get uh, some other commissions or some other great art. So check it out, lenperaltastore.com. Good stuff, Len, as always. Also good stuff from you, Justin Robert Young. Let folks know what, uh, I, I know you're remote today. What have you been doing last week? Well, last week I was in Ohio covering the Republican primary and the battle between Josh Mandel and J.D. Vance. In two weeks, I will be in Pennsylvania covering the battle between uh, McCormick and Dr. Oz for that uh, uh, contested Republican primary. And then I'm down in uh, Georgia, all of which you can find at the Politics, Politics, Politics podcast, including this Friday's episode, which will be a return of our very popular panel, myself, Jen Briney of the Congressional Dish, and Andrew Heaton of the Political Orphanage, the Political Triad, reunited tomorrow on PX3. Don't miss it, everybody. Also, don't miss giving a big thanks to a brand new boss that we got, Psycho Motors. Psycho Motors just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Psycho Motors. Psycho Motors is going to get more DTNS. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, thanks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's been a little bit of a slow month. So, uh, new patrons, we applaud you. Be uh, like Psycho Motors, it. and the show won't be over now. That's what I'm saying. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the show, there is a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. If you know, you know. But if you don't, find out more at patreon.com slash DTNS. We roll right into it after this show. But just a reminder, we're live Monday through Friday on DTNS at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back doing it all again tomorrow with our guest, Terrence Gaines. Back to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>